Oh, I love you. Oh, I love that. Oh, love, love, love. We use love, the word love, to mean so many different things, don't we? I love strawberry ice cream. Oh, I love that poem. This is my partner who I've loved for, for 25 years. I love God. We talk about love and we mean completely different things. And so this month we're really going to be breaking down. What are we talking about? We're going to be referencing a book called Four Kinds of Love that was written about 60 years ago by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, a British theologian. Um, and I'll tell you, if you read it, it's very sexist. It's written in the 1950s. And he has a very different vision of God than most people I've ever met in Unitarian Universalism. Much more kind of a hierarchical sense of what God is. But we'll be using that frame because he's basically referencing ancient Greece and how in ancient Greece they had four kinds of love that they talked about. Storge, which is the love of affection, things that we just feel affection for. Philia, as in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Philia means friendship, even though it's a gender-based word, it really isn't. Eros, erotic love, the love that you have for somebody who is deeply beloved in a sexual sense. And agape, or love of God. And the week that we do agape, which will be the fourth week of the month, we'll also bring in the Latin word caritas, which means more beloved community, a deeply spiritual sense of community. So we'll be talking about agape. So we'll proceed through the month with those kinds of love as we share and invite you to reflect on what love means in your life. Storge is affection. So you might have somebody that you kind of know they're not really your friend, but you know them for a long time. You see them in meetings or in a community that you're both part of. And over time, just getting to know, oh yeah, they always do that. Oh yeah, they're always like that. Whether you love it, hate it, or you're neutral about it, it's simply the familiarity that pretty soon over time, you're gonna start to have a warm feeling just about the familiarity of who they are and what they do. C.S. Lewis says that while people talk about eros, erotic love, as the primary reason that murders are committed, you know, jealous passions, he thinks actually that interrupting what's familiar to people is even more deeply threatening sometimes than that their lover loves another. Because it's by kind of putting together what's familiar and what we have affection for that we create lives that hold us, that we feel comfortable in. We wear that old pair of slippers that are worn out, they don't look very good, but they felt good for years and we have them. You know, we put on that shirt with the frayed sleeves and we wouldn't wear it out of the house, but when we need comfort, that old sweatshirt is going to bring it to us more than any beautiful piece of clothing that we own. When I moved away from Minnesota, which I did, I lived in Boston for five years and Washington DC for 10 years. When I would move, I realized that a lot of what I would miss was simply what was familiar, not my best friends because I kept in touch with them, but more acquaintances, more people that I had affection for, not people that I was super close to. Because you're not really gonna reach out to someone you hardly know and say, hey, how's it going? And I think in a way, Facebook is so powerful for many of us because we can have that kind of connection among people that we're really pretty neutral about. Some of them we adore, some of them we can't stand, but most of, at least my Facebook friends, are people that I just kind of know, they're acquaintances. That's a powerful kind of love as it builds over time because it builds our identity. The thing that's weird about storge, about affection and familiarity, is that actually we might feel that for something or someone we don't even like. I mean, use this example. Sometimes I'll hear the chords of a song on the radio and I'll be like, oh, I know that and my heart kind of goes up. 
And then as the song starts, I think, I never liked that song. In fact, I can't stand that song. Once my rational brain kicks in and starts to think about it, but my initial response of just familiarity is, oh, that. And sometimes, if there was a song from, say, when we were young, even if we hated it when we were young, simply that it's still around and now we're not so young can bring up that feeling. So all kinds of love have a, have a shadow side, have a danger. And I think part of what C.S. Lewis is pointing to about the danger of Storge and why it could lead to some pretty irrational behavior is that we might not remember to bring up our critical mind to say, actually, I don't like that song. And while with a song, that's a pretty neutral thing, it might also be that there are habits or patterns or relationships that are actually not loving at all, but to which we're bonded. So if we in early childhood had a parent who was abusive in a particular way or neglectful in a particular way, we may bond with other people as adults who treat us that way simply because it's familiar. And that kind of bonding is actually dangerous for us. Similarly, those of us with privilege who have been brought up to believe that the way that we are is just the way it is, even when we're confronted with evidence that other people don't have the privilege that we do, that in fact the way that we are choosing to live is dangerous to others because of the resources that we're overusing that other people can't access, because of the way that we make choices that perpetuate our privilege in a way that takes it from others, we may be so bonded with those identities which we received early on that it feels threatening to our very self-identity to let go of them. The writer James Baldwin, who wrote decades ago about race and racism and whiteness. So James Baldwin said this, identity would seem to be the garment with which one covers the nakedness of the self, in which case it is best that the garment be loose, a little like the robes of the desert fathers, through which one's nakedness can always be felt and sometimes discerned. This trust in one's nakedness is all that gives one the power to change one's robes. I love that image of identity, not as the naked self, but as the robes. Because if you think about your life, by bonding with what's familiar and who you think you are at a particular time, you've probably worn really different robes. You've probably thought you were a really different person from one time to another. And I love the permission that comes from thinking of those identities as robes so that we can find our fundamental identity, which I think is located in our interconnectedness, in a place where our individuality truly falls away. If we trust that we are part of something that is beloved and beautiful, then I believe we have the ability to take on and off the identities that come with what we're trained to like. That's true. And so I encourage you to think about your identities as things you can take on and off and to look this week at what parts of your identities come from affection for things that you didn't choose, that just have become familiar to you over time. And maybe, like the song on the radio, you don't even like them. At the same time, we all need places where we feel comfortable, where we can relax. And so as we look at those things that maybe we've bonded with that we don't really love, that kind of storge, that familiarity that actually isn't great for us, I invite you to find healthy, loving, wonderful things that really do come through your whole system that are also comforting on a daily basis. So if you grew up in a household where everybody smoked and there was just tobacco everywhere and there were cigarette butts everywhere and to you that just felt like clean air and familiarity, but now you don't want to smoke anymore. 
it's important to think about what would be a good replacement for that for you. What would actually make you feel the same way that all of those ashtrays did of being at home? And maybe it's having, as a friend of mine does, keeping an empty ashtray out because she loves the ashtray, even though she quit smoking. So we all need to look for ways to hold what holds us and to let go of what diminishes us, even if it would seem to be saying to us, this is your fixed identity. If you let go of it, you'll have nothing. We need to trust that we can take Storge on or off like the robes of the Desert Fathers.